Hey guys, happy Wednesday uh, to all our subs and followers and people that want to check out our channel. And happy Thursday to our special friends over the seas. Um, tonight, you know, maybe some of you have always wondered why in the U in the United States does you know somewhat significantly you know better economically than a lot of the countries south of the U.S. border, Mexico, you know, Peru, Bolivia. Um, and maybe some people are like, hey, you know, th these countries are older, you know, were founded much earlier, but still like the United States does better. We're going to cover that today. We're going to do it with a very, very cool guy in charge of Ancient Americas. It's an awesome channel. You all should check it out. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to give the mic to um, Pete here. And you can maybe tell us a little bit about your channel and what brought you about um, Ancient Americas. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. So um, like Marcus said, I'm Pete. I'm uh, the creator of the Ancient Americas channel on YouTube. Uh, it's a channel that's dedicated to the exploration of, you know, ancient American pre-Columbian history um, from both continents, North and South America. Um, been running the channel for about, um, for a little over a year now. Um, and basically I got the idea to start this channel when I, um, this was back years ago, but I had basically started kind of stumbled upon, um, some books about pre-Columbian, um, America, actually one of them I've actually got right here. It's, oh, you can't see that at all. 1491 new revelations before the, of the Americas before Columbus, if you ever want a good overview of pre-Columbian America over the whole thing, that book is really awesome. Highly recommend it to anybody. Um, but I started reading um, about, you know, Mesoamerican history and South American history, North American history, um, and kind of realized that there were thousands of years of history that, that I had never learned. Um, and, you know, I'd always kind of you know, fancy myself a history buff, you know, and when you're a history buff, you kind of have, even if you don't know something, you have a rough idea about it. And I just didn't know anything, you know, beyond like, you know, like the Aztec Inca Maya, you know, like the big three pre-Columbian cultures. Um, I realized that there was, you know, thousands of years of history that just, I didn't know that I was never taught and kind of almost felt like I'd been, you know, cheated when I had grown up that like, you know, that so much of this was never covered by, you know, my school, my teachers, you know, um, popular literature, or, you know, dare I say the history channel back in the day when it actually did history. Um, so, uh, so I got the idea originally to do a podcast. And then that morphed into when I was still planning it out, I realized that there needed to be like a visual aspect to it i you know i didn't just want to say oh yes and then they made you know pottery that looks like this or they made this art that looked like this i actually wanted to be able to show people what it looked like and so i went with youtube started researching and making videos and you know rest is history i guess that's awesome you did the history channel dirty my friend <laughs> <laughs> history channel ain't what it used to be i agree i remember back when i watched uh what was it wasn't it about ufos or something <laughs> i think it was it's a long time ago but um yeah that's true i can i can see that with a lot of other channels as well um i gotta ask though what's been your favorite part about um you know running this this channel this oh channel? ease Oh, hands down, just the reading, the research, like, um, you know, writing up like everything I know. Um, that's been a lot of fun. I mean, I basically get to pick what I want to learn about. There's very rarely anything that doesn't sound interesting. There's a lot of interesting things. If you, you know, if you kind of just have like a, you know, a bird's eye view of what pre-Columbian America mm -hmm. looks like. And so I just get to, you know, I just get to pick something that I want to learn about. And I just, you know, get to, you know, immerse myself in, you know, in books and articles about it. 
and pull out what I think is interesting and, you know, turn it into a video. I mean, just, yeah, that planning is easily my favorite part. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, not being biased, but my favorite part is <laughs> the video that I brought up with the um, T1, was it T1E2? Tiwanaku, yeah. Tiwanaku, yeah. Some really interesting stuff, like things that, you know, even I you know, learned about as far as like the tools that they use and mm -hmm. the type of stone, right? That they, I think it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like all the stone, like architecture and stuff. Oh, yeah. And the agriculture, too. Just... Yeah. The, yeah. There's a lot of like really, yeah. I remember when I first learned about like the raised fields, too, like I got really like blown away by it. And, um, I got really blown away by it. And I was like, you know, like other people have to find this interesting too. Right. Or am I just <laughs> crazy. Hey, I remember I watched your video about, um, corn and like in the Americas and I was mm -hmm. blown away with the amount of detail you put in there. And I was like, I was like, everybody needs to watch this video. Like people <laughs> just don't realize the implications of everything. Like, I don't think I'd even thought about it like that deeply until I watched mm -hmm. your video. I'm like, wow, <laughs> excellent videos. Yeah, once, yeah, it was funny because actually, I think it was in the 1491 book. There's a section in there that deals with like, um, there's a section in there that like deals with the domestication of, uh, you know, of corn. And yeah, I just remember reading it and being like, oh my gosh, like I have to turn this into an episode. And I remember at the time I was planning to do um, like a whole different episode. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like this has to be made like now. And I like shoved everything aside you know, and just, yeah, made that episode. I really liked it a lot. I'm always, it's not one of my more popular videos, but I'm always happy when people comment on it. Cause I'm like, cause I'm always like, yes, this one was so much fun for me to make. Yeah. And the animation that you use too, and, the, and everything that you put together, how long does that usually take? Did you say? Uh, that, that depends a lot. Um, for like for videos that are like a bit longer, like a bit heavier in animation, it can take about, um, it can take about two weeks. If it's really light, um, it can take probably less than a week. It just, it, it really depends. And then it also kind of just depends on like how much time I have, what's going on with life. So. Yeah, that too. Same with us, like with Juan Chilo and I, we usually got to go through some articles and, figure out mm -hmm. what we're going to say to make sure we don't look silly <laughs> <laughs> yeah but well, the funny I was gonna say the funny thing is is almost after every video somebody will be like oh you like could have talked about this too and like they'll send me an article and i'm like oh my gosh like i you know i i totally could have like i wish i hadn't missed this so i have a lot of regret like along the way <laughs> Yeah, no, I've seen some comments actually that say that like, no, we want to add this in here as well and stuff like that. But it, it, that's great that you have so many people that really you know follow your, your channel and really love your, your content that you put out. Yeah, it's been really, it's been really surprising because when I started the channel, I really didn't have a good idea of, um, of how many people would be interested in the topic. And so it's really satisfying to see that a lot of people do want to learn more about pre-columbian history in the americas um and you know it's it's a topic that's criminally you know criminally undervalued in my opinion i mean you know you know if you go to school american history basically starts in 1492 if you're lucky they'll kind of go into some back history about the people that were already there but they're never going to go farther back than that. You know, you're never going to learn about, you know, you would never learn about a place like um, you're never going to learn about like, you know, the mound cultures from like the archaic period in North America. You're never going to learn about places like Teotihuacan in Mexico. You're never going to learn about, you know, the Norte Chico in Peru, which you should, because that's like one of the earliest civilizations in the world, like not just, you know, in the Americas. So um but yeah, I mean, you know, the education, you know, according to like most school curriculum, you know, history starts at 1492, unfortunately. Yeah, that, that's an excellent transition going into the other part that I wanted to cover was just the, the lack of um, information that they give to the students to be able to absorb as far as indigenous life outside of the United States. I mean, obviously we learn little parts of the Aztec empire, the um, Mayans, the Incan civilization, 
but I mean, does anyone even know about the Mapuches and that they weren't conquered throughout <laughs> the entire like part of you know uh, the whole Spanish colonization? Like yeah. even now, like you hear about the issues that are going on. I, I put a video about it, like how they mm-hmm. their territory back, and this is insane to me. Like people only think that like Spanish colonization it, it took over all over like there's no areas that were saved or survived mm-hmm. but there there were there there was a lot of resistance in southern chile um and i just watched a video about it so yeah there was a, yeah there was a lot of resistance in a lot of places i mean the the maya especially were really difficult for the spanish to conquer um mm-hmm. the last the last maya um the last independent maya uh, city wasn't conquered until 1697 i mean that's like that's 200 years more than 200 years after columbus hit the new world you know and this was a region that like that spain first entered in like 1520 so like that's a long time for them you know to finally like eradicate the last maya resistance and then even after that i mean there's like you know like there's uprisings and stuff. I mean, the Maya didn't go quietly. They, you know, fiercely resisted, you know, Spanish control. And it's kind of interesting too, because, you know, it kind of sounds, um, it kind of sounds, it kind of sounds paradoxical, but large empires fall faster than smaller, you know, than like, um, than like more uh, nomadic or like divided groups. So, you know, with the Aztecs, you know, you can top, you know, you can basically throw out Montezuma, you know, take over the empire, assert your control, and you basically inherit an imperial system that's already there. Whereas if you're trying to conquer a whole bunch of Maya city states, I mean, you have to like, you know, you, there's not just like one ruler that you can just topple and then take everything you have to go through every single little city state and Mm. clear it out, you know, which is interesting because I like to bring up, um, like a lot of people don't know about my tribes of Huachichil. They were part of the Chichimeca war. So the Spaniards had defeated the Aztecs and they Mm -hmm. actually brought slash Collins up there with them. And they got completely wrecked by guys that didn't have as much, you know, they didn't have as much armor. They didn't have as much like, um, like they didn't have the mackle wheat obsidian swords. They just had, they were just extremely good archers and they were nomadic and they really knew the desert region. And these guys were able to defeat all these conquistadors with, with uh, firearms and who had armor and horses and, and you don't really hear much about it, but, um, but it is interesting how mm-hmm. it's much harder to defeat a nomadic people yeah. that you can't go and burn down their village because they're constantly on the move as opposed yeah. to an empire. Yeah. So. I mean, you know, you can always just, you know, pick up your roots and go somewhere else. You know, you can always just retreat further back into the wilderness if you need to. The, um, ju- I'm not actually sure. The Guachichil, are they like part of the Chichimex or... Yeah, so the Chichimeca, okay. that's a term that encompasses... Um, a- I think like five to eight. Yeah, yeah, tribes. it's a broad term. It's a broad term, but uh, the Guachichil was one of those. What they were the largest. They were known as the largest like tribe, okay. um, and also the you know the most fiercest fighters as well. So okay. uh, from my genealogy that I did, I I would be well. I I descend from them, and I thought they were extinct because a lot of the history um, books and like articles say that. But I got in contact with some that are that they still have an indigenous community and. In, in Mexico, and when I told them my genealogy, they're like they like welcome me in, so they considered okay. me like a brother, which was pretty cool. That's super cool. But but uh, but yeah, I've been learning more about their culture and stuff. Like the language doesn't exist. There's only I mean, there's like 500 words left, but they're trying to like find more if possible. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that's actually that's actually an interesting point because I think a, like another reason why why a lot of it doesn't get taught is that I think that there's this idea that a lot of those native peoples don't exist anymore. You know, it's like Columbus came in, the Spanish just, you know, spread over the continent and then they just like disappeared. I think, you know, I think part of that is that we have like a very fixed idea of like what an indigenous person looks like. And, you know, if you're not living on like, you know, a reservation or something, if you, you know, are wearing jeans, a shirt and drinking Coca-Cola, then, you know, you're not like, you know, that's not what indigenous people look like, mm-hmm. you know? So I think that they either blend too well into society or they're just invisible to society because especially in the case of the United States, you know, you're, 
um, very much outside of it. You're on like reservations a lot of the time. Yeah, and that's the issue with schools too, is that they teach these kids to be like, well, the image of a Native American or indigenous person, at least in the US, is someone that has like a teepee or lives in a teepee and, you know, lives out and is very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Primitive, mm -hmm. I think. And they don't teach them how, like, like you said, it's the, the, the identity of being indigenous and native is very confusing, I think, to, to most people. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have a quite like good understanding of it um, because there's just so many tribes south of the U.S. border. And it's funny because, you know, like what Juan Chaloa said, you know, there's a Guachichil tribe that was very accepting of him. And a lot of the, the people that criticize us are like, no tribe's ever going to accept you. Never. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I know Lakota tribe tribal members are and obviously Quanchaloa's tribe accepted him. yeah so I hope that, that yeah I mean that and and like what I do here on the podcast they completely agree with what I do they want you know mestizos or detribalized natives to return to their roots mm -hmm. they think that's a gift they don't criticize that mm -hmm. yeah but, um another thing that like isn't really covered I think in the education system is just the the inventions that Native Americans create and indigenous people do like that contributed to the society that we're living in today as far as the crops mm -hmm. like we saw your video about the <laughs> mice I pronounce it wrong I say maize but a lot of people that comment on it say that it should be mice I mean where I'm from, we just call it corn. So I'm doing my best. <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> and, it, good, and like, I mean, most people that I hear, you know, hear say maize. I mean, they're not they're not Hispanic. They're not Spanish speakers first. They just say maize. So that's what I go with. But you know, but yeah, if you were speaking Spanish, I think it would be maize. Maize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And yeah, corn, maize. Um so many fruits and vegetables squash beans peppers like you could go on it like if like our culinary like you know our culinary arts would be so impoverished without like all the crops that that like people of the americas domesticated like it's really had a huge impact in the world you know and there's even and it's interesting there's a lot of um there's a lot of other crops that people don't think about like uh, manioc or cassava. Some people call it, but like, that's like, you know, that's a food that's like, you know, big in Africa and Asia. It doesn't really get consumed very much in the United States as far as I'm aware of, but you know, like that, but yeah, that's like a huge crop in like other areas of the world. And if they didn't have that, you know, like, you know, you know, they would have a completely different diet. They'd have a completely different, you know, culture that, that would be missing from it. It's true. And like, you know, the animals that they domesticated as well, the, well, was it, I guess the turkey was domesticated. Mm -hmm. Turkeys, uh, turkeys, llamas, alpacas. Um, there's actually, I actually just read this article. I hope I'm like, I'll keep this general or else I don't want to spoil what the next episode is going to be. But there's actually evidence that at a certain spot in Mexico that rabbits were like bred in captivity as like a food source in this location. And so there's investigations going on to see if like these like jackrabbits and stuff were domesticated at some point and mm -hmm. that they were used as like a local food source. Um so, I mean, there's even stuff that we might not even know about. And then, oh, and then also the dog, you know, that's another big one as well. Yeah. And uh, guinea pig. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The I was going to ask uh, Pete, because like kind of growing up and like learning about this stuff in middle school and high school, um, I kind of had like, like, it was kind of implied a lot with the way the wording was with a lot of the history that a lot of these like natives like south of the border just all were wiped out kind of because they, they harp so much on the diseases like wiping out a bunch mm -hmm. which I, I that did happen yes but mm -hmm. like did he ever get that kind of like um thought oh yeah or? oh yeah totally yeah it's it there's actually there's actually some more that I want to say about this so I'm sorry if I kind of go off on a tirade here but like, yes, you're absolutely right. There's this attitude of like, oh, well, the diseases came and, you know, wiped out 
the Native Americans and, you know, like they're not here. We're here, you know, especially like if you grew up in the United States, I mean, you're not, you know, you know, unless you're in like a, you know, a very diverse environment, um, you know, you're not going to see a whole lot of people that identify as indigenous in the room. So you kind of just have this like ingrained notion of like, oh, well, like, you know, you know, I, me, the rest of like my friends are here, you know, and there aren't any indigenous people here. So even if you like understand in the back of your mind that indigenous people exist, like, you kind of get this notion, at least I did, you know, reinforce that like, oh, well, they're not here anymore. I don't see them. Um, but I would actually say that about the, um, about the diseases, I find that a lot of people, whenever um, somebody wants to bring up like, you know, the treatment of Native Americans during uh, colonialism, you know, the like brutality, the violence, the dispossession, a lot of people will just say, oh, well, you know, that's just like, you know, like the Native Americans were just wiped out by disease. Like, you know, there was nothing anybody could have done about that. And, you know, it's a tragedy, but, you know, they got wiped out and, you know, like, you know, the white people moved in. And I find that that gets brought up a lot to kind of dodge the, the, the issues that nobody wants to tackle, which is that, you know, a lot of indigenous people like, were you know brutalized were you know like massacred in a lot of cases or enslaved you know and you know or like killed um when they offered resistance and i find that like a lot of people use you know diseases to kind of avoid talking about those issues you know they kind of want it to just be like that's the narrative it's a done deal nobody gets blamed you know we don't need to talk about it so so yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, to come all the way back around and answer your question, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a reason I think why a lot of people think that indigenous people aren't around, but I think that there's also a slightly more insidious element when people try to talk about, you know, what happened to Native Americans. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it is kind of a, well, first I think that people think that they don't want that guilt on their plate. So mm -hmm. why do we want to talk about that? I don't feel like, you know, feeling ter terrible today over the rest of my <laughs> But see, that, that's what's interesting. Like, you know, the, like the descendants, right? Um, mm -hmm. The settlers that did this, you know, and, I, you know, some people can, I can catch life for this in the conversation. They aren't guilty for what their ancestors did. Okay. So mm -hmm. like, there are there still is some oppression against indigenous peoples to this day, especially if you go south of the border of Mexico with a lot of these colonial governments. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you can't put the you know, I'm not really religious, but I'm just going to use like the wording, basically, like in the Bible it says you can't uh, the sins of the father, not the sins of the son. You, I, I would say you can't put a, all that all those atrocities on the people that are alive today. They mm -hmm. don't do any of that. So in my, in my opinion, people shouldn't feel so guilty. It, it's just important that this discourse happens so the truth mm -hmm. can come out and people can keep it in mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's not so much finger pointing. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's because, yeah, it's not a matter of like casting blame. In a lot of cases, I think it's a matter of just like fixing issues that are, you know, that we, that we have because that happened, you know. I mean, you know, I, I don't think I need to go into, you know, detail about, you know, the problems that afflict like, you know, like um, Native American reservations in the United States. I mean, like, you know, the like, you know, like drug abuse, alcohol rates, like education rates are poor, dropout rates are like really high. And, you know, like, you know, that legacy needs to be confronted if those issues are going to get addressed. And so it's not about blaming people. It's about like, hey, this is a problem because this happened long ago and like these are wrongs that need to be righted. At least that's the way I see it, you know. Right, and, and th that's a very reasonable way to see it. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, just, I just think some people like, it's like shouldn't get defensive. It's like, don't, don't mm -hmm. internalize that guilt as in like, I did this. Like you didn't do yeah. anything. You were, you were born like 20, 30, 40 mm -hmm. years ago. Like you didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's just fixing the problems now. And, and mm -hmm. I, I see this attitude with a lot of people with issues where 
they want to bury their face in the sand. They're like, oh, no, it didn't happen. I'm going to deny it and it'll go away. But it never goes away if you do that. You have to confront. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like we're not trying to be like, you're going to feel bad and you're going to like it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not, that's not our goal. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, to wrap this little part up, like I think there is hope for the future as far as bringing in the, the more inclusion for certain parts of Native American mm -hmm. history. I think that the direction that we're going in in society with teachers, um, you know, some things I maybe others don't agree with or not, but I think as far as like including indigenous studies go, there is more room mm -hmm. for coverage of like not just Aztec, Inca, and Mayan, um, other tribes, their inventions, um, their what they've done for American society today, mm -hmm. and also covering you know the suffrage as well as what's mm -hmm. going on, um, talking about the uh, encomiendas, um, haciendas, the slavery section, which I think when most children in the elementary, middle school. When they think of slavery in the Americas, it's only, you know, Black, African-American, um, not so much Indigenous um, slavery. And I just read another article that, you know, I'm really um, interested, well, interested in, like, you know, not a bad way, sort of like, well, you know what I'm saying, like with Indigenous mm -hmm. slavery yeah. in the Americas, Mexico, Guatemala, and South America. But there's also slavery in the United States as well. A lot of Natives were sent to the Caribbean islands to work on, um, in Cuba, and the Dominican Republic um, for crops, but some were sent to, I think, not just Europe, but even Morocco or Northern parts of Africa. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot more to do for um, the upcoming generations, but I think that there's hope. Mm -hmm. And the article that we had um, went over earlier was, uh, I think we had talked about the indigenous leaders like tribal leaders wanting more education about their their contributions to mm -hmm. American society um, in the classroom and I think that there's hope for that yeah I really hope it gets better and um, I, I think it will I mean you know especially with um, you know with like re-indigenization movements and stuff like you know as that gains steam as you know I would expect as more and more people identify as indigenous and want a better representation in the curriculum. I mean, hopefully they can, you know, they can pressure for more change. Yeah. Thank you so much. For that and, and channels like yours that are trying to um, obviously educate people on the history that they miss in school. So, Ooh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just good history. Like I find it, I find it really interesting and it's history that I think stands on its own merits. I mean, I don't, you know, every, on the first day of history class, like every year, every history professor teacher is always like, Oh, why should we learn about history? And then, you know, some like, you know, like some smart ass kid is like, Oh, so we can learn from the past, you know? And I feel like that's like, you know, the, you know, like, the answer somebody would give at like a political debate or something but um but like no it's like but i've always kind of been like no like this like this is interesting this is useful purely on its own merits you know like we shouldn't have to justify learning about the heritage of like certain people or um i i also look at it in this way a lot but like learning about the heritage of a land you know after all like you know, I live in a place that, you know, like I live on a continent that has like its own history. I don't have to just look back, you know, to, you know, ancient like Rome, for example, for all my ancient history. You know, there's also ancient history here, too. There's ancient sites you can go visit. You know, it's, you know, it's compelling in its own way. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's a lot... I think there's a lot more for us as you know Americans to discover as far as like you know ancient America's you know your videos and just a lot more as far as tribal history just things I think that we can really learn and benefit from. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I think we can move into the the bigger part, which is you know why you know how we as a country came to this point. Um, I think we can cover a lot between you know from 1492 up until like the independence movements and it gets mm -hmm. a little dicey from there. Um, but I think the first part I wanted to cover was how it all started. What did Europe have 
for, to come here. You know, obviously, uh, knowledge of shipbuilding. Indigenous mm -hmm. and natives had you know ships. Well, indigenous and natives, same word, um, had ships. You know, canoes, mm -hmm. but not at the size that you know the ships that were built in Italy and Spain. Um, unfortunately for them, and then the tools that they had. I think that not enough credit goes to the weapons that you know Europeans used. I mean, without guns, you know, where did guns come from? They came from China. Um, and then also other tools as well. Um, I think, uh, what was it? But what I wanted to add on was that ships, you know, the weapons that they had, the monetary system. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, I know when Columbus came, he had these trinkets that he was giving natives. Um, like glass beads or something? Yeah, glass beads. Yeah, something no, like that. The hawk bells. Uh, it was in a book that I read about Christopher Columbus, which I assume were like maybe similar to beads. Um, but I think that, you know, obviously when the difference is, is that, you know, Europe was surrounded by Asia, Africa, and all of these trading that you could do. And, and not just Europe, like talking about Spain and Britain mm -hmm. in particular, they were surrounded by other European countries that had all other inventions as well. Not just, I was just referring to China as an example. But, you know, countries in, in Africa, the Middle East, I think steel came from India, if I'm not correct. So just so such a huge access to all these things in the old world. So when you do all that trading and as insane as, you know, the 1400s and before it was, they still managed to have these weapons, um, these items that they had, and then bring them over to, you know, the Americas. Not that I'm saying that people in Guatemala, Peru, you know, well, before those names weren't like extremely primitive, but unfortunately we didn't have access to those. <laughs> Indigenous people didn't have access to those weapons until later. And then of course, other tools as well um, and giant ships. Sorry, you're gonna say something? Those are all really good points. No, I was just listening, but um, so I've like wondered about this as well. And one thing that, you know, comparing the history of like the old world to the new world, um, I think that there's like a couple of differences. So, or a couple of important differences that nobody talks that much about. So it's interesting that you bring up like the transmission of different technology, different knowledge, you know, from like, you know, China, India, Africa, you know, a lot of it gets shared together um, because, you know, it, it's very much an east to west landmass. It's very easy to traverse that, especially when you have pack animals like, you know, camels, horses, you know, you can travel a lot faster. It's easier to get from one end to the other. Um, and like I said, because it's a landmass that is mo much more east-west, especially in the case of Eurasia, mm -hmm. it's got like a much more contiguous climate across it. You know what I mean? You're not going through like, you know, tropics, desert, tundra, you know, like tropics, desert, you know, you're not going through, you know, you're staying at like a fairly consistent latitude, whereas North and South America they are like, they're the opposite. They're North to South, you know? So if you try to go from one end of the continent to the other, you're going on foot because I mean, unless you have a llama in the Andes, I <laughs> suppose, you know, you're going to have to, you know, there's no other, um, you know, domesticated pack animals that you have. And I mean, you know, llamas are great for the highlands, but you know, you can't just like bring a llama into the jungle, you know, it's, it's just not going to survive there. Um, so in order to transmit stuff, um, you know, through, you know, through the Americas, you'd have to go by foot, you'd be moving really slowly, you'd be going through like a bunch of different like, um, what's the word like temperate zones, tropical zones, you'd be going through like a lot of different latitudes, I guess, where the environment is, you know, can vary quite a bit. Um, so I think that those are a big difference, just that the way that Eurasia is, it lends itself to just like easier, faster transmission of knowledge than the Americas do. I mean, clearly, you know, 
knowledge does get transmitted. I mean, you know, we see things like maize or corn up here in Mexico, and then it spreads throughout, you know, the entire continent. And, you know, we can tell that there's trade routes, you know, up the coasts and stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's interesting when I look at it, that's kind of the big differences I, that I see in the continents. And that's just my personal observation. Like I haven't like, you know, dove into this or anything, but those are kind of the big differences that strike me. Um, with them so when people try to compare the two you know I kind of like to stress like it's not really apples to apples like you're looking at very very different circumstances it would be very strange to me if you got similar results based on how different the circumstances are yeah no that's that completely makes sense and I wanted to add that I don't know maybe you're aware that was there trading? Did the Polynesians get to the Americas? I thought Easter Island was predominantly a Polynesian. Yes. But. Yeah. So um, actually, it's funny because I've wanted to address this. So um, so Polynesia, Polynesians did contact the Americas. They did reach the Americas. Amazing. And I think a lot of people have seen those headlines and mm. not really read the like you know the article itself and you know they draw their own conclusions so the polynesians don't really start setting out into the pacific until like ugh, I, I gotta remember this but it's basically um in like the common era like they're not doing this before the common era where they're setting off into the pacific and settling islands like you know tahiti hawaii um guam and stuff like that um, by the time they hit the coast of South America, I want to say it's like 12, 1300 or something like it's, it's definitely after a thousand AD. It's pretty late in the game by then, you know, the Americas are densely populated. There are empires, there are kingdoms, you know, they can't really do what they normally do, you know, when they're settling on, you know, these like virgin islands in the Pacific that don't have any other human population. Now, the reason that we know that they hit South America is two reasons. Someone, um, someone uh, discovered like chicken bones in South America that date that like carbon date to before uh, Colombian contact and chickens aren't native to the Americas. So who could have possibly brought them over? kind of makes sense that you know polynesians would they have them i mean if you saw moana hey hey you know so um and then also so it's either sweet potatoes or yams one of the two polynesians had and that's not native to asia that's native to south america if i'm recalling but the big like nail in the coffin is that they've done genetic studies that show that um that people of South American descent, um, you know, intermarried, had children with people of Polynesian descent. Now, those people that have that mixed DNA, like they're Polynesians today. So, you know, my guess is that somebody, you know, somebody must have like hit the coast of South America, you know, met a nice girl, got a wife, you know, brought her back with him across the ocean or something, had a family. Um, it's not like Polynesians hit South America and like populated it. Like that's not really what the data shows. The data just shows that there's contact, but there's not really like a continuous, you know, cultural exchange. There's not like a populating of Polynesians within the Americas, um, which I think like a lot of people assume that that happened. At least I see a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, the first Americans were Polynesians and they came over. And I'm like, the Polynesians weren't sailing at like, you know, 20,000 BCE. Like, give me a break, you know? So, um, but yeah, I think like a lot of people want to, you know, when they see that headline, they want to infer that from it. And that's just not the case. So, yes, there is Polynesian, there is a Polynesian connection, but it's not what everybody thinks. Hey, and thank, thank you for uh, enlightening us on, on that, because uh, I had still been needing to actually read on those articles, too. But mm -hmm. um, I was going to make a joke when you mentioned the chicken. I was going to be like, oh, it was because the real Native Americans were African-American. <laughs> I was going to make a joke. Probably not. I mean, I, I mean, you know, 
like homo sapiens come out of Africa. So, eh, you know, you can make that argument, but then everybody's African. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. In, in that, in that sense, yeah. yes. But in the sense of like how the Avocentrics <laughs> want to say it, no. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I w- like, there are times where I definitely wish it was that exciting. It's just not the, the evidence just isn't there. If it ever is, like, I'll definitely cover it, but not there. <laughs> I want to figure out how the heck they got those statues in Easter Island. The ones with the faces. I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what I wanted to get back over to is that there were actually horses like a long time ago in the Americas. Mm-hmm. But I guess they <laughs> disappeared or they went back over the, the, the Bering Strait or something because obviously during the time of, you know, 1492 and onward, there were, horses were extremely new to, you know, the natives at the time mm-hmm. and armored horses, but yeah, it's... I made a joke with Marcus, because, like, I don't know too much about llamas, but the Incas couldn't use llamas like cavalry, you know, to get mounted <laughs> warriors. <laughs> An armored llama would look intimidating. Unfortunately, you can't ride a llama. I actually remember asking somebody that as a kid, and they were like, "No, a llama's not strong enough to hold like an adult." And I was like, "Oh, oh shoot, that would, like that stings." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, maybe like small kid for an alpaca. Oh yeah, I'm sure if you're like a small kid, yeah, totally. Yeah, but um, so then getting into the next part was with Spain and how they formed to, you know, they had a large hand in forming what we see today. Um, starting off with the encomienda and haciendas. And we've talked about this in other videos and how that was really detrimental to the success of, of native people, obviously, because, you know, in Juan Chiloa's eyes and, and mine, we see it as the slavery, essentially. I was about to say, in slavery, yeah, enslavement is not beneficial to yeah. anybody. <laughs> it does not help when you try to enslave the majority of the population of you know, native people. Uh, obviously, Clutch Collins were excluded, but I don't know if all of them were excluded. Because in the book that I had read, a lot were like still chained up. And I think I brought that up in another video. Um, when they were on their way to Guatemala with Pedro Alvarado to conquer yeah i've i've actually it, i've actually wondered that too but i i really don't know like what became of the entire slash colin people after the conquest but yeah, yeah i do know that some of them were were with um alvarado when he went into um guatemala to you know fight the maya so but yeah i don't know what happened to the rest of them that's i need to find that they out. uh as far as I know, they, uh, I actually have Tlaxcalan ancestry. Um, I found it genealogy, uh, through genealogy, which is really neat, but, um, they were, they were spread out. Like they, like, again, they were used against the Wachichil and the Chichimeca groups. They were brought up there to, uh, after the fighting stop to serve as Christianized, like Indian examples for people to follow. And mm-hmm. they brought them all the way up until, until, uh, into New Mexico. Like the Spanish really utilized them as, as warriors, but, um, well, what's interesting is that they had the most status and privilege out of all the Native Americans, at least in Mexico, but they ended mm-hmm. up disappearing as a tribal group entirely, which is really ironic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because like the Tlaxcalans, Collins, I mean, there were so many, they outnumbered the Spaniards, obviously. So when the Aztec Empire ended, were they just all like, were the Spanish like, okay, we know you outnumber us, but you guys got to assimilate or else? It was like, or else, or else, what? They, there's millions of, of, of Clash Collins compared to like the small group of Spaniards. So they just willingly assimilated. It's crazy to me. Well, I mean, don't forget, like a lot of those, you know, a lot of those Tlash Collins, you know, no matter how, like, no matter how good their relations were with the Spanish, I mean, most of them would have been dead from disease, you know, eventually or in the succeeding generation. So if there were a lot of them to start out with, I mean, you know, tragically, a hundred years later, there probably weren't that many. So, but yeah, yeah, that is a good question. But yeah, you've really got me thinking about like what happened to them now. And 
I get, I'm gonna have to lay, I'm gonna have to get a book on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, need, I need to read it more up on them. Like, like it's, I mean, it's interesting. I have those two bloodlines, but I, I know so much more about the Watch Chill than the Slash Collins, but I think there's more written on them in general. I, so I need to do my reading. I would think so. Yeah. Just because they played such a pivotal part in the conquest. I'd be really, yeah, there's got to be a lot written about them. Yeah, I just got to take the time to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You go book hunting. Um, so the thing that I think is really interesting with the differences between colonization and imperialism, the Spanish goals, was that they Spanish colonization was more so of extracting the resources and the Spanish getting what they needed, the elite, mm -hmm. than going back. And the Spanish Empire, they failed in their goal as if this was a goal, was to supply enough people from Spain to go live as settlers in countries like Guatemala and Mexico. Obviously, there are people of Spanish descent there, a pure Spanish descent, but it's a very small minority. Um, of course, you can make the argument against me again, when I bring this up, Argentina, Uruguay, it's a little bit different in some ways. Um, but, you know, going back, when you bear a majority of the population and throw them in this caste system where the Spanish are on top and they're a minority and everyone else, even their loyal, you know, so-called, you know, mestizos were bared from doing certain things. They, they ban banned from obviously not having the same rights as, as a Criollo elite. Mm -hmm. And yet they willingly went in this system, which is... It's crazy to me. Well, um, one thing that I would th that I would also bring up is like, yes, the conquistadors like did, you know, want to plunder and extract as much wealth from, you know, from their conquests as possible. And, you know, we, we can definitely go into like a lot of detail about that. But, you know, there's also another force within the conquest and that's the church. You know, they want to convert you know as many of you know the indigenous people as possible you know that's part of their mission um i would i would argue that the conquest is primarily you know a you know is primarily like a violent one a military one that's led by the conquistadors you know that's i think is the primary goal but you know the catholic church basically makes sure that you know that there's like a presence among the indigenous people in the new world that's like trying to assimilate them um, into Spanish society. You know, like you said, into like definitely in a caste system. I mean, it's not like, you know, a fair and equitable treatment of the indigenous people, but they're still trying to, you know, to um, assimilate them into this society. And, you know, and this gets into the, uh, this gets into the encomiendas but, you know, you know, part of that assimilation is having the natives, you know, become a labor force for the encomiendas because as, you know, like as, you know, the Spanish basically dole out, you know, rewards for all the conquistadors, um, every, you know, every, every encomienda basically needs a labor force to work it. Um, the, you know, the idea behind Spanish colonization and you can, and it's interesting because, um, the roots of this you can see um, even before the conquest of the Americas during the Reconquista in Spain. And then when Spain conquers the um, like the Canary Islands and um, the Canary Islands and stuff, you know, they kind of, um, you know, have somewhat similar, um, like a somewhat similar system. Uh, where the land, you know, where like it's not just having the land, it's cultivating the land and having people to work it. Um, so that idea, you know, kind of comes over with the conquest. And um, when you're given an encomienda, you're not really being given land so much as you're being given like um, land to run for the crown. But what you do get is you do get to be put in charge of, you know, all the natives that live on that land. It's your job to, you know, protect them, to make them work so that the land is productive and then to Christianize them. Like that's the big goal of the encomienda system. You know, at the end of the day, it's 
you know, it's a system that's based on profit, you know, basically the Spanish have this idea that like this land, you know, needs to be worked. It needs to be cultivated so that it can make money and turn a profit, you know, and whether you're just engaging in, you know, like just staple crop farming, whether you are doing like cash crops, like, you know, like sugar cane or something, you know, like you're kind of expected to like make money for the king. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. I, I wanted I wanted to correct myself really quick. Um, for our viewers, I'm aware of like the caste system, maybe I've used something interchangeably. It goes, I think, Spanish conquistadors and then the criollos who were the Spanish that were born in the Americas. Um, the second thing I wanted to correct was obviously not all people who you know were called as mestizos willingly wanted to be a part of this system and defend Spanish. Obviously, there's a lot of sentiment towards the Spanish caste system and the Spanish in, in general. I just wanted to clear that up so I don't get any <laughs> hate for the incorrection that I'd, I'd brought up. Um, but yeah, you bring up some good points, Pete. Um, and I think that 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 caste system, the the encomienda, um, the Spanish just saw the, the natives a, a lot as just you know work, uh, you know workers that would never they never die out. They thought that they had an unlimited amount of people until you know with disease. Um, they had to start bringing people from Africa over. And then I'm, I'm mostly talking about Cuba right now, where you see a lot of Africans, um, African people, uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, obviously Haiti. It's a little bit different story with the French, Haiti Revolution. It's another topic for another day. Um, and of course, obviously in, in Venezuela, I think too, and in certain parts of Central America, um, obviously it's, there's more so in, in different areas. But again, you know, going back to why we see the world as how it is today was the fact that the, I don't want to call them overlords, but the, um, the European colonizers that were there in Central America, Mexico, also the Spanish colonizers that were there, wanted to make sure that this population was kept down, the native population down, that they wouldn't rise up. I'm sure there were a lot of revolts, which we'll get into another little topic about. There were a lot of revolts, but after the independence movements, that still carried on. Like there was the, the native people were still, you know, mm -hmm. looked at as below. Now, when you fast forward to the current century, you see so many people still living in conditions that, you know, compared to us, the United States are obviously not the same. So when you keep a majority of the population down, that's going to have major implications into the future, um, especially when <laughs> the, the, the most of the Spanish settlers and the elites went back to Spain and brought all the resources and the treasures that they've gotten. That's even worse. They didn't even stay to help, um, obviously, with the independence a lot left anyway. Um, so you can see that all throughout Guatemala, um, you know, Mexico, all over you know, Central and South America. So are you going to say something? No, no, I was just listening to you. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, you're bringing up good points. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, w and one of the articles you said, Marcus, the Latin America versus the United States by Sanford A. Mosk, I got it pulled up here. But um, one thing I, I guess I didn't realize, like, that has a huge impact is obviously these conquistadors, like, they were running the encomiendas, and they forced a lot of these natives to work. But uh, I don't think people think about this holistically. Like if that was, that was the case for a really long time and the conquistadors and their descendants owned a lot of this land. So that robbed the indigenous people a lot of the chance to basically accumulate wealth. And also they were being taxed out the ass uh, a lot too. Um, if you read Fifth Son by Camilla Townsend, um, they were really getting taxed by the crown, like to, to the point to where many of them were starving. They didn't have anything. So you have all that going on. So the indigenous people there can't accumulate wealth, can't invest in their communities. And then the conquistadors and all these Spaniards are taking all the wealth back to Spain, all these Lords. So then nothing's being invested into the societies there. It's all just getting robbed. Uh, I think that's plays. I mean, when you have centuries of that, I mean, obviously you're going to feel the effects today, in my opinion. Well, one of the, uh, one of the other articles, um, also talked about how a lot of the encomienda, the people who are running encomiendas, the encomienda, encomenderos, um, 
that they would also try to like buy up like a lot of the land a lot of like these you know indi- like indigenous communities that you know maybe were not originally part of the encomendero but they somehow managed to you know seize control of it and then in that case like you know that's not like crown land like that's personal property that you know the encomendero you know as he's kind of like building up his own property can like run however he wants and then just like a feudal system you know the you know these farmers turn into basically serfs you know and they basically get forced into this you know subservient relationship with the uh you know with the encomendero or you know the landowner um and it it also brought up this point too that i think is like really good that we forget about but you know when you're working somebody else's land you're not going to work very hard you know you're only going to work as hard as like you have to to not get punished you know you don't have a lot of personal incentive (laughs) to like work super hard and you know generate as much like surplus as possible like no you're just you know you're you know you're nine to fiving dusk to dawning that stuff like you know like you're just doing a day's work pure and simple you know you're a disgruntled person at like your crappy job (laughs) <laughs> right uh which i mean okay like not to get into too much of the you know capitalism but like i do like capitalism be- at least in this country because somebody that's poor can rise up to wealth but um but yeah so you take that element away and the, mm-hmm. i mean it goes into your pain, point pete like mm-hmm. they're not gonna have motivation like what, what spurs a lot of grow, uh, growth in a country and an, ec- an economy and a society is mm-hmm. people's motivation to do better and to build mm-hmm. and if you don't have that motivation then you're lacking a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like what you and, said. Sorry. Oh, no, go on. Oh, no, no, no. I, I was just going to say, I like what you said, Pete, uh, about like the, <laughs> the nine to five job and, you know, the, the income there was wanting to like do that much work because the Viceroy, uh, I think of Central America, I think his last name was Mendoza. Uh, he said that he, one of his something, something that he said that was quoted was do everything, but do it slowly. <laughs> 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 so um i'm always curious on what what life must have been back then but sorry pete what were you going to say uh, i was just gonna say um you know also there's like another thing that's like not helping the issue is that like there's a lot of you know corruption you know spain basically has an economy where they're, they're you know extracting like all this like wealth like you know silver is like a great example you know you look at like you know, the mines of Potosí in South America, you look at like, you know, the silver mines in Mexico and, you know, like hypothetically, you know, like so much of, you know, this wealth is supposed to get like, you know, it's supposed to belong to the king. Um, and, and so, you know, as they're like extracting, like, you know, all this like wealth, And, you know, doing it with, like, a lot of Indian labor with, like, you know, horrible, horrible working conditions. Like, if you ever read, um, uh, I think it's Jose de Acosta. He was a priest in South America. He actually, like, witnessed the working conditions um, in the Andes. But, um, but, yeah, like, horrible conditions and everything. On top of all that, though, like, the corruption is rampant because, you know, you're so far away from Spain, like, nobody's monitoring like how the indigenous people are being treated even though there are you know laws on the books that you know you can't treat them this way they have these rights you know nobody's enforcing that you know in south america the king's so far away you know wealth that's supposed to like stay in south america you know does not stay in south america wealth that's supposed to go to you know the um you know, to like the viceroy, the local governments and stuff like, you know, doesn't a lot of it's getting skimmed off the top. And so, you know, a lot of greed, like, I think, you know, really kind of wrecks a lot of, you know, progress that may have been made. Um, But I mean, at the end of the day, all Spain, you know, all Spain really wanted to do was to just turn the Americas into a giant cash cow. So, you know, they weren't really that interested, I think, in developing like, you know, a complex economy. Um, and actually, right. if, I can, if I can say a couple things, like, I don't think people understand, like, I don't think they appreciate, um, like, how, like, the Spanish greed for, like, silver and gold, um, like, the, the Spanish basically extract, like, you know, just 
like unimaginable um, amounts of silver and gold from the new world. They take it back to Spain. You know, they just like pull more and more and more of it out of the ground. It like devalues the currency back in Europe because there's just, there's such an abundance of silver. Um, And, you know, through all of this, you know, you think that like the Spanish would just like kick back and like, you know, like, you know, make just a, a Scrooge McDuck vault full of silver. Like, no, like they're spending this money, like, as like faster that it's coming in, like Spain goes broke, like time and time and time again, they're just, there's never enough silver, like for the King of Spain, for, you know, the people running the Spanish empire. And that just blows me away that like they had that, like they're pulling out all this wealth and it's never enough, you know, like it, it's and never satisfying. That's something that I was always wondering. It's like, okay, like the Spanish empire, shortly after all these conquests like they got really weak compared to the british and the french and they i mean they just sucked after a while right and it's like when you got all these resources what did you do with it it seems like they just squandered everything it's like you would it should have like it should have been like they would they'd be high really high up and and advanced with all this like wealth and resources but yet they they just got weaker and weaker it's like it boggles my mind well but like you know i mean kind of think of it as like a um like a country that's like rich in like one resource like let's suppose you have a country today that's like you know that has like a lot of oil but it doesn't really have anything else like those countries don't really have like complex economies with like high standards of living because those countries basically know all we need to do is just like extract all this you know like we just have to exploit this one resource export it out of here and we can just like, you know, like we can just pocket the money. There's not a whole lot of incentive to like diversify an economy like that, you know? So uh, that would be, uh, that would be, that would kind of be, um, you know, my assessment of it. Like the Spanish were just out to like extract as much wealth as possible. They weren't really like, and not only that, like, um, so when you have that much money and you can just pay for anything, like, you know, like a lot of other countries like the Dutch, the British, you know, they're developing like really strong financial institutions like banks and like stock exchanges and stuff. Spain's not doing that. Like why, why would they, they, they just have all the silver coming in all the time. You know, they can just buy what they want, you know, until they just run out of money, wait a little while and then just get, you know, next year's like silver shipment from the new world, you know? So by the time, like, you know, the silver starts tailing off, like, you know, you know, Spain's just like, you know, Spain's just way out of date, you know, they don't have an economy that's like, you know, that has those institutions to the extent that like other countries do. Say, so, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense when you put it like that. So that's why they weren't able to keep up with the British Empire, or the French mm-hmm. Empire over yeah. time. Mm-hmm. I believe I mean, like, Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, if anybody's like ever played like civilization, it's mm-hmm. like when you get a whole bunch of goody huts, and you're like treasury is flush. And so then you can just like, you know, neglect your economy, conquer a bunch of stuff. And then you realize like, you know, centuries later that you're overexpanded and that your economy's weak and, you know, you haven't built markets and forums and your game just plummets. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That game. (laughs) Um, But I was going to add in that there's also a lot of political instability back home as well. I know that they were still recovering from the Moorish war, at the time, I wonder if there was more invasions from the Moors as well into Spain that caused more, you know, issues in the motherland for them, and also the Napoleon invasion. But I think that happened much later, which caused yeah. the dependence of the countries mm-hmm. in Mexico and Guatemala, and I think was the rise of the um, Simon Bolivar and the other independent nations now in South America as well. The big thing that Spain was doing um, back then was like. Uh, I would say like the source of the turmoil was that they were fighting Protestants. Cause remember, um, you know, when, you know, remember with, um, is it Charles, I believe it. Yeah. Charles the first is not just the, em- the emperor of Spain. He's also the Holy Roman emperor. He's in charge of the Spanish Netherlands. So when the Protestant reformation breaks out, you know, he and like his, you know, Habsburg relatives, you know, they basically got to stamp out like all these, you know, like all these heretics, they got to fight all these Protestant armies. And so 
they're devoting a lot of attention to that. And that's where actually like a lot of the silver goes is that they're, you know, they're, you know, paying for, they're paying soldiers to fight these wars. They're, you know, paying mercenaries and stuff. They're spending gold on like building more ships so that they can, you know, move people all around. And yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. I forget that the Netherlands was part of Spain. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Learned something new here. Yeah, I'm sure other countries were. That's, yeah, that's actually where um, Charles the First. That's actually where he was um, born, if I recall. He wasn't born in Spain. He was born in the Spanish Netherlands. And then when he, and I forget like how exactly like who he marries to inherit what, but basically, um, but basically he came out of the Spanish Netherlands, and I believe that you know he marries somebody, inherits the Spanish crown, and then like also inherits. The holy roman empire i would need to like read up on exactly like how that all works but he wasn't like from spain originally if i recall correctly now, if i'm wrong somebody can correct me in the comments i'm sure yeah he's a dutchman i'm kidding <laughs> I'm dutchman. um and I, you know going back it is crazy i guess the spanish just thought that they had expendable um you know war employee not even you know natives they thought the work was would never end. And it's crazy that even though, um, you know, they colonized, they went over to the Philippines as well to trade the mm -hmm. silver with China, even with all that, they still failed. And you can see the, well, they didn't fail, but obviously Spain is not in the economic position that the UK and Germany is in. Like when you see the current, you know, refugee crisis, uh, the refugees, I think that came from Morocco, a lot of them, <laughs> um, don't settle in Spain, even though they enter Spain a lot, try to get into the UK and in Germany. Um, not that I'm saying that there's a lot in Spain, but it's just interesting to see, you know, how different, you know, Europe is between the North and the South in particular. Uh, and different like levels of colonization, like with the Netherlands um, and the UK compared to the colonies they had compared to the colonies the, you know, Spain had and see how much better off the colonies are. Not that better off, but how different they are in terms of economic you know, policy. Um, I know that the Dutch had Indonesia and um, I think- South they, Africa. South Africa, mm -hmm. yes. And um, I thought there was a country in, wasn't it Suriname? Probably. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they had that as well. And then there's also a few Caribbean islands, like I think, I think like the Antilles or one of the, a few of the islands there. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. One of the Caribbean islands and the French and, and briefly long Island. Let's not forget. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. I remember after New York was named after, I think the Dutch, I think, no, 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 no. No. Cause it was new Amsterdam. And then when the English got it, then it became New York. Got it. Got it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And then like with the, the UK, they had, you know, colonized obviously a lot of the world too, um, a lot in Asia as well. But obviously, you know, different empires, different times of the native populations of South America compared to a colony, not colony, but the people of India that was colonized by the British, um, you know, two entirely different ways of life. Mm -hmm. So going back, I think that another problem, well, not problem, but issue for the Spanish was that they couldn't get that many settlers from Europe to stay in the Americas. Like we just talked about the, the, mm -hmm. the people, the elites uh, went back to Spain. They didn't stay there. The, 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 the tropics and the, the geography was, was too much too different for them compared to especially North America, more plains and you know fields where in South America, it's a lot of jungle uh, mountains, not really so good for many Spaniards to settle in where like in the United States, uh, they open their borders up more, I think, to people from Europe to come and settle, you know, from the UK, Ireland, Netherlands, all over, you know, Germany, France, where another point to look at is that South America is much further away from Europe than the United States, um, especially from the UK, where a lot of the settlers came from. Of course, you know, fast forward actually after colonization was, was over and the independent countries came into place, 
that's when you really did start to see more settlement into, you know, European settlement into like countries such as Nicaragua, Mexico. Um, obviously, vessels for transportation were more advanced. You know, you started seeing steamships. Um, so it is interesting in that point. I think compared to the you know the startup of the United States and the startup of Spain. But then again, I don't know what the, the future goal was. I guess they never thought that their their countries, their their you know Guatemala would become independent, Mexico would be its own country as well. I guess they thought it would never end. Yeah. Um, but I think you know, what we're going on real quick is that like going about geography as well. It, but it's interesting with Brazil. I think because so many you know immigrants came in, I think Brazil really really wanted people from Europe to enter in yeah i mean well it's like when they first colonized everything yeah they struggled to get a lot of settlers um mm -hmm. because if i remember a stat for mexico in 1550 there was only 20,000 white people there and 20,000 black people in mexico in, in like 1550 1560 and that's like nothing compared to i mean i haven't looked at the stats for the numbers that were in you know the 13 colonies right you know the u.s the pre-us right um but i i would bet it, it was way more than twenty thousand white settlers there yeah with brazil though they they had a huge african like population for the slavery and also because africa was pretty close to brazil as well like you had um all the countries on the east west coast um and you know what's crazy is that slavery didn't end in Brazil until like, what was it, the late 1800s? Almost into the 1900s. That's insane. That's like, Damn, you know, man. Born, like in that freaking century. <laughs> That's to me. I mean, technically, it's still going on if you want to bring about what's going on now with the Amaz people in the Amazons being hunted down, the, the ranchers, and you know, obviously people in the government. You have Lazarno who do not care about indigenous people. Um, or native people at all it's very sad i think something needs to be done immediately like this can't go on or else more people are obviously going to die i, I personally don't think that brazil should be in charge of the amazon rainforest i think it should be protected um i i, yeah, I think the amazon rainforest needs to be treated as its own separate like entity New, neutral territory no country can venture in because you still have all those indigenous peoples i think that needs to be respected as their territory like you yeah. can't be venturing into them the people in the government do not care like i don't think it even matters what race it is like if it's white black whatever like it's not worth trust putting that much power into someone's hand like i see it i don't care how biased i sound i don't trust that government to handle the, the issues going on with the, the amazon rainforest um, no i think at this point like i said there's still so many indigenous people there that um you know they have their sovereignty, like this idea of any government, it, it even being a debate, especially like nowadays in the present world scene where you have the UN, where's the UN? Why is the UN not saying, telling Brazil to back the hell up? So that makes me think like, what if we put it under the protection <laughs> where like we're in charge of the planet? <laughs> but what if the, the United Nations was to be in charge of the protection of the Amazon for a rainforest would we be able to 100 percent like fully trust the united nations i mean i would like to think i don't know because i mean i've heard so i mean okay so like the united nations has done good for the world but i've also heard that they've done some pretty fucked up shit so i don't know man it, it would have to be heavily supervised like in a perfect world i would like i would like to say yes leave it to the united nations they would send peacekeepers they would and make sure people stayed out they you know the sovereignty would be respected yeah. but i don't know that's in an ideal world and we don't live in an ideal world yeah like i just read something in reddit where blazarno is wants to give the okay for ranchers and construction miners to destroy more land and like get rid of indigenous rights people's you know sovereignty there it's insane like he does not care it's going to keep on going hey pete uh, i think you're going to say something real quick yeah so <laughs> What I was going to say is that um, I think there was a very different attitude with, you know, with a lot of those conquistadors in the early days. I think a lot of them were basically of the mind like, oh, I can go to the Americas and, you know, we'll conquer, you know, the next big empire and we'll all, you know, 
get rich and then we can go back to Spain and, you know, just live out our lives, you know, being rich and never working another day. And one thing that's kind of telling about that is that in those early days, there are so many more men that are going to the Spanish colonies. You know, there are, you don't see like lots of women, lots of families that are going over. It's very much like, it's very much a guy's club. It's very much a lot of, you know, soldiers, mercenaries that are going over there to, you know, get rich quick and, you know, like any, you know, like any gold rush, very few of them actually do. I, well, yeah, that, that leads me into a question I had for you, Pete. In your opinion, if Spain had a comparable amount of settlers like England had, do you think they would have, things would have gone the same way, or do you think they would have basically copied England and, the, and like the French in terms of pushing the natives out rather than trying to assimilate them and make a caste system? That's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. I don't think that would have happened just because if the Spanish did that, at least if the conquistadors did that, I feel like there'd be a lot of voices in, um, in the Catholic church that would basically say, Hey, what are you doing? Like, we're trying to Christianize and save these people. You know, we can't save them if, you know, they're out there, you know, they have to be in here for us to do that. Um, you know, when you look at what, and France is kind of similar in that way, you know, they send out like a lot of missionaries, you know, like, you know, down the St. Lawrence and stuff, you know, guys like Pierre Marquette kind of, you know, go through the Great Lakes region. Um, and, uh, you know, Spain, or sorry, England, does, you know, that element doesn't really exist. Like there's no, like the Church of England never really has this desire to like go out and, you know, convert the Indians to Christianity. I mean, nowhere near to the extent that like the Catholic Church in Spain does. So yeah, I still, I yeah, even if there were more people, I don't think that would have happened. I mean, that's not... I mean, I suppose it still could, especially when you look at countries like, you know, Argentina, where a lot of people, you know, a lot of like, you know, Spanish descended people do just kind of push out that indigenous population. So, I mean, who knows? I think you can make a case for it either way, but my gut kind of says, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, you brought up a good point like that I hadn't considered the, the Catholic Church and their mission. I mean, the yeah. Catholic Church was a huge player with everything. So, yeah. Always remember the the conquest the conquest of the Americas is like, you know, it's a political conquest and it's a spiritual conquest. You know, there's like there's two aspects to it. You know, the political conquest is completed, the spiritual conquest not really. You know. So the conquistadors are pretty much like zealots. <laughs> in, in some ways, religious zealots. Because I say that because in the book, like that I read with um, the Spanish accounts in Mexico and the Americas, they like thanked God for every single thing they did, especially Hernan Cortez. And he said, if it was not for God, we would never, never have been able to win this war or like we would have never been able to do this, 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 or that. So they very much were extremely connected to Catholicism um, in a lot of ways. I think in, in, in not, not good ways, obviously, because they made excuses for what they did, their actions, um, and used God as, as ways to defend them for what they've done. Um, yeah, it was good. It was a way different which, time. I mean, you know, just, you know, back then, everybody was so much more religious, you know, things like the separation of, you know, church and state that we take for granted. I mean, those didn't exist back then, you know, like religion and, you know, like public life, I guess what we would kind of call like, you know, secular, or like temporal, like that was all the same, like, you know, so yeah, we might think of like religion as something like, you know, kind of very like inner, something very private. And like, it wasn't like that at all back then. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's a completely different world. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting that the, I mean, the religion is like, uh, cultural inheritance that a lot of these uh, Central and South American countries have because a lot of them are predominantly Catholic. But one other thing I forgot to mention to you, Pete, was you brought up a lot of the avarice and corruption that 
the Spanish officials had. And it's interesting because the main criticism a lot of Mexicans have for the Mexican government is that they're very corrupt. So it's almost mm. as if that got passed down too in terms of the culture. Yeah, um, corruption is something, and this is just you know my own musings, but corruption seems to be something that kind of gets like passed down. Like once it's in like, you know, civil institutions, it's very hard to get out. Like if you look at like a lot of, you know, like a lot of former communist countries, for example, like they tend to have a lot of corruption too, because, you know, greasing the palms of the local official back in the good old communist days was just how things got done. And just because, you know, you have a new government, you know, a democracy, a lot of those same bureaucrats that are, you know, still making a living, you know, working their desk jobs, you know, they can still do you favors, you know, they can still, you know, take money behind the back. So, yeah, I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like, I think a lot of that stuff persists to the present day. Yeah, that's, you can see that too. We were, we were talking about Brazil. We were just basically saying that that's kind of, I mean, it's included, but also kind of excluded because it's a Portuguese, <laughs> Portuguese colony. And we don't cover that much Portuguese colonialism, to be honest. I mean, we should, mm -hmm. um, but just saying how they had a different sort of settlement as far as like Europeans coming, mm -hmm. they really opened the gates up. I think um, when the independence movement started, obviously, because you have, like I said, uh, advancement of travel was more common with like steamships coming in, bringing in more you know settlers, but a lot of people from Germany and um, I think, what was it, France? Not France, but obviously Portugal, but Portugal is so small. Like the population of Portugal is like 10, 10 and below million people, which is insane when you think of Brazil. I mean, obviously not everyone in Brazil is Portuguese, but just the fact that mm -hmm. that small little country had such a huge impact on the rest of Brazil is crazy to me. Um, but yeah, going back to the Americas, I think one thing to point out uh, between the United States and, and the rest of you know, South America Central America is the fact that because they opened up the gates for more people from Europe to come in, I feel like European settlers, regardless of where they came from, obviously their issues between France and Great Britain seem to get along better, which further processed the advancement of the United States more, where unlike the Spanish in some ways, it almost seemed like every man for himself. There was a lot of animosity between the Criollos that were born there and the Spanish elites, which caused the problems that you kind of see afterwards with the wars of independence, um, the internal corruption that's going on that went on during then, where it seemed that the Europeans in the United States, for better or worse, seemed to get along and, and understood the goal was to you know, you know make profit and settle and bring more of your family members over. Yeah, I mean, in that, in that article you sent, Marcus, the Latin America versus the U.S. again, um, it did mention that a huge reason why Europeans were more apt to immigrate to the United States was because of the potential for success, because you had much more of that capitalism where you could, that dream where you could be poor and you could rise up and be wealthy. Whereas like in Argentina, I forgot the statistic, but it was like a high degree of people that, immigrated Argentina that were European return back home because why because they came there and became they became tenant farmers and they had they couldn't move up the chain they couldn't acquire land that was already taken right somebody already owned all that there's no way to move up socially so a lot of people got frustrated and went back so and you I, had that going on let's say my ancestors that's actually um one of my uh my great great grandparents actually immigrated from um Italy to Argentina and then I guess like stayed there a few years, didn't like it and then emigrated to the United States. So it was funny because when I read that, I was like, oh yeah, that's just like, you know, that's just like, like my ancestor. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that is. Didn't like Argentina, so decided to come to- I Guess not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then another point I wanted to bring up before we wrap up, like talking about Spain was the, the church and how much big of an influence it had on the, the colonies, I think, you know, with the taxes, um just the insane view of wanting to make sure every well, like seeing natives as, as heathens so seen as the majority population the native population which is quite large as i said in south and central america compared to north america and getting them to be christianized 
um, obviously there are a lot of revolts against that as well, where people from Europe that were that came to the United States, well, that came to the Americas, North America, were fleeing, you know, the, the persecution, wanting to get away from the church. Um, of course, I think, what was it? There were Protestants mm-hmm. that settled in North America. They weren't exactly escaping religion, but just the, the control from the church itself, um, being able to be more independent, um, which brings us up to, you know, the United States um, and how the development of their, of, of that area is obviously doing much better than, than Spain. Spain's, you know, former colonies, you know, South America, Central America, um, advocating for independence. That was the goal. It's like having your own, you know, land, not being, there weren't encomenderos in, <laughs> in uh, North America. Obviously, like when we're talking about Mexico, not Mexico, but Texas, California, it was different because there was Spanish colonization there. But when we're looking at, you know, during the 13 colonies in that era, then after it was more for like being your own man. You don't have to be in control of, of someone else, of some higher entity. Um, and then going about with, you know, there was more of a concentration of African slaves in the South um, with the industry of, of um, what was it? What was the resource? Cotton, right. And then moving well, first along. it would have been tobacco. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, tobacco. Um, and then moving the natives of North America further out West, um, you know, minimizing that threat and then bringing more, you know, people from Europe in uh, to the east part of the United States, you don't have as many revolts, which is something that we talked about earlier was, you know, you had so many advanced civilizations and they, the people didn't just disappear. They still were, you know, they maintained their own you know, way of life despite being under control of Spain. Um, and of course you had more unity, I think in, South America as far and, and more uh, I think united animosity towards the, the the elites of Spain that tried to put in control um, you know methods of, of racism and injustice and there was more natives obviously in Central and South America you had more chances for revolts where unlike in the United States um, they were reduced to you know living in states like Oklahoma and other areas um, that weren't so good. Was I missing something from that? That's a pretty good rundown. I mean, yeah, the fact that natives are not assimilated into, like, the fact that natives are not assimilated into the United States population definitely has, like, a huge effect on the United States. You know, there's not the racial tensions that, you know, spring up in the Spanish colonies between the indigenous people and, you know, the Criollos and stuff. Um, I mean, just, you know, look at Mexico, like how many like revolts happen because, you know, like somebody basically like, you know, unifies like a lot of the indigenous groups and, you know, they, you know, like revolt against, you know, against, you know, colonial Spain or, you know, the Mexican state or whatever, you know, there's always this, you know, this tension that exists between the colonizers and, you know, the native people. And in America, that's not really ever a thing. I mean, indigenous people are never brought into the political system. They're always just scooched out. Um, So um, one thing that you did mention, though, that I did want to address is you did mention that there's like, you know, no encomiendas in, um, you know, no encomiendas, like no, um, you know, great estates like that, and that it's small farmers. That's true in the north, where it's main, you know, where the population is mainly, you know, small farmers and families that are coming over and, you know, colonizing the land, you know, like fencing in their farms and everything and tilling their land. In the south, though, in the south of the 13 colonies, that's very much a plantation economy. You know, you have that, you know, plantation lifestyle that dominates the Caribbean colonies, you know, where you have, you know, somebody running a large estate, you know, planting cash crops, usually that in a sense kind of gets recreated in the South. 
The only difference is, is that, you know, it's not indigenous people that are working those because there's just, there's not enough indigenous people to do it. And if you tried to enslave them, I mean, these are not sedentary people. They'll just, you know, they'll just book it into the wilderness. So then you have to import African slaves to be the labor source. Right. Um, yeah, just something that I would qualify. Um, but yeah, no, those are, those are really good points. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, what's interesting when you mentioned that about the South is I, that article did go into it where the South, um, because of the way it was set up that way with the plantations and like mm -hmm. one person owned a large amount of land and then you had tenant farmers there too. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also, you mostly had slaves, right? Mm -hmm. um, they were behind economic, uh, economically compared to the North. So the South had to catch up. And that, that's also a big mm -hmm. reason why they lost the Civil War is because they were oh, yeah. very poor mm -hmm. compared to the North, who was mm -hmm. very industrialized. So mm -hmm. that's also interesting because the South would, I would say, would be more comparable to those Latin American countries in terms of being very behind. And then, mm -hmm. they, you know, it was the North that caught them back up and modernized mm -hmm. them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's definitely true. The South is very much like yeah very much an agrarian economy the north by contrast is you know way more diversified i mean you have you know you have like you know fishing farming trading um like i said earlier you know in england there's like you know like there's much more robust financial institutions you know like banks and exchanges and stuff so you know, people um, have just better access to capital and stuff than you would in New Spain, which I think plays a large part in the development of um, the 13 colonies. I mean, you know, the land, like, you know, the East Coast is not like this, you know, it, it's not like what the Spanish had in like Peru and stuff, you know, it's not like, you know, dripping with like gold and silver and stuff like, you know, it's, you know, pretty unremarkable, I think, from a geographical standpoint. Um, and so instead, like, you know, instead of just this, like, extraction, plunder-based economy, they actually have to create an economy that's, you know, that's diverse, you mm -hmm. know, and those kind of opportunities, obviously, you know, they attract people that, you know, that want the opportunity to do that. And I think that kind of plays, like, a big role also in, like, the culture of the United States, or what would become the United States versus like the culture in New Spain where people are immigrating, you know, in those early days, cause they want to get rich quick in the early days of 13 colonies. There's definitely that too, but you know, people kind of eventually, you know, figure out that like, Oh, like if we want to do something here, we kind of got to do it ourselves. No, thank you Pete, for the, addressing that actually. I guess my focus was too much on, a little bit too much on the, the 13 colonies and the natives. And I, I was almost excluding the part with it, obviously the plantations you know, going on in Florida, Alabama. And uh, gosh, when I watched that movie, what was it? 12 Years a Slave? Oh my gosh, that was, oh, that was one of the I, hardest movies ever. Sorry. I, I can't watch movies like that. Like I just get too worked up. It's just like, yeah. You know, it's funny because like when you read a lot of history, you read a lot a lot of depressing things like history is not a happy subject it really isn't and like i've you know i've just read things that like have just chilled me to the bone and like when someone's like you should watch this movie and i'm like dude like i hate reading about that stuff like it's not <laughs> fun i'll still like read it but like why would i want to see it like it would that would just chill me yeah i i can't watch movies like that i would just get too worked up and yeah, no way. You got guts for watching that movie. Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't want it. it was too much, man, for when I had watched it. But um, yeah, and what makes me wonder, though, like fast forwarding a little bit to the um, Mexican War, Mexican American War. And I think that really shows just the imbalance there was between like that's when the United States was really picking up steam. Mm. industrialization of the north um and i think was yeah mexico was independent then yeah yeah they were independent mm -hmm. and yet they still lost you know they lost the war with the united states um i wonder if it was because of weaponry or un unorganized you know military well, you know weapons. they had they had just finished fighting a revolution before shortly before that war too so they were weakened to begin with anyway yeah because isn't that right before because Santa Ana comes to power in Mexico a little before then, right? 
I, I'm not I, super I familiar so. with it, so like I'm yeah. But so, I mean, I, I, I like wrong. I just think it's a big deal because it's like I mean, you lost a lot of. I mean, obviously, fighting amongst yourself, you lost a lot of soldiers, a lot of experienced men and commanders. So it's like that's mm-hmm. gonna be a crippling blow. Yeah. Already. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, and I'm sure the United States, you know, had other help as well at that time. Um, well, that and also Mexico had like a really low comp- population compared to the United. I think it was like seven million at the time, and the the United States had way more than seven million. I don't know what it was. Also, oh, yeah, don't forget 30s. that like a lot of the you know like, I mean, that war basically got instigated because you know American settlers wanted to go into Texas and you know like kind of form their own nation basically so there were a lot of people basically on the ground you know at the border within mexico who want to fight mexico and break away so i'm sure that like you know that's like you know that's an advantageous position to have right off the bat yeah yeah Yeah. that That is true wonder like what happened to the people that were living there (laughs) Once the United States won like Texas and Arizona and California, was it just like, yo, you want to be an American citizen? Or is it just like, you know, shoo, shoo, go. I was always under the impression that they just got annexed. I mean. Yeah, I think I think yeah. they did. I, I, I think it was weird, though, because, I mean, they eventually, I mean, those Mexicans had to go through their own civil rights kind of deal with the U.S. too over time. Because, I mean, they weren't liked either in the beginning anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you follow um, the opium war that happened with China and Britain, Pete? Yeah, mm, yeah, I'm familiar with the opium war. Yeah, I, I always wondered. Like, I, I, I'm trying to. I need to start a book on that. Not start a book. Like, write one. I have a book about it. But um, what happened after the British, you know, won the first opium war? Were there Chinese fishermen that lived on Hong Kong? Did they get booted off, or did they get just? Were they asked if they want to be a citizen of the, the British? I get, my guess is if they could eck out a living in Hong Kong, they probably ecked out a living in Hong Kong. If they couldn't, they probably just, you know, went across to the mainland and just picked up a living there. That was my, yeah, sorry. That's like <laughs> extremely random and off topic. <laughs> but it just, it's been in my thought for like, in my mind for a while, as far as like, I wonder how that worked as well. You know, kind of similar to what happened with like Texas and California. Yeah. No, I mean, the way I look at it, people just want to make a living. You know, they're not like, it's funny because I think like when we look at history, we imagine that like everybody's invested in it the same way that, you know, we, the reader, we, the consumer of history are. And that's not, you know, that's not really the case. People don't, <laughs> people back then didn't see it that way. So, <laughs> you know, they're just like, they're just trying to put food on the table like next week like that's what they're thinking about probably yeah yeah not sure um you know all this talk and everything have you seen the movie uh what is it called la otra conquista the other conquest i don't know if you can nope. speak spanish i know there's subtitles in one but it, I was it, say, I, if their subtitles were good <laughs> yeah yeah it really highlights well it's about some guy who was uh in the aztec empire and it was like I think he was an Aztec and right after the war ended he woke up in a world where it's pretty much like 1522 so as the Spanish Empire is starting to create its influence and like and start to take over and I think some you know some conquistadors find him and then they you know forcefully you know Christianize him and it's a really you know it's hard to watch in some parts but it really shows how that all went about like the mm-hmm how it really messes with you know, the native's mind as far as like going from a, a faith that they had followed to converting into Christianity. Um, I would recommend that. Of course, like I told you. There's What's it called again? Uh, the Other Conquest. The Other but Conquest. In Sorry. Spanish, it's the Otra Conquista. Um, uh, All right, I see it here. Okay. The actress, I think it was in the movie... Um, predator but i forgot what her name was but she played as the translator for her man cortez as i said there are some dark parts but it definitely highlights the the humanity that like natives had to go through to christianness Mm -hmm. but anyway this was a very very enlightening like talk and 
I really enjoyed it. We'll have to we'll have to cover the second part, which is um, which I think gets more interesting, which is like the American influence in the the countries of you know Guatemala, El Salvador, um, and just how what life was like after the independence. And because we we I feel like we only covered part one. Well, we're talking the long run here. We covered a small part. Of I was about to say you this. could honestly talk a lot. You could honestly talk a lot about this. Yeah, like we there's need... so much to cover. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Like other types of colonization, uh, we really didn't talk about Canada. I, I mean, the Caribbean islands we touched on. There's the only mentioned Brazil. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> the thing we were talking about Brazil was just like the rainforest and like the ever impeding like the cattle ranchers and the people in government that really don't seem to care about what happens to the the Amazon. Oh man, you know, it's really like it's really sad because um if you there's been like some really amazing archaeology that's happened in the Amazon in the past um like in the past like 20 to 30 years and the indigenous people of the Amazon figured out how to take like, you know, like the poor soils, the dense jungle, you know, just the you know, at first glance, inhospitable environment of the Amazon and turn it into like hyper productive, like farmland and, you know, like, and, you know, curated forests and stuff like um, forest gardens. That's the word I was looking for. And it's, and when you read it, it's just like, like, why are we burning the Amazon? Like we could totally be doing this right now. Like, indigenous people understood this like they figured out how to just you know like they didn't figure out how to survive in the amazon they figured out how to thrive they figured out just how to completely win the game and like we're not doing that we're playing checkers and like they played chess two thousand years ago so yeah like i could go on about that it's like super interesting so yeah whenever i see like just the news of stuff in the Amazon. I'm just like, guys, you're doing it wrong. Like, you know, like there's a right way to do this and you're not doing it, but people knew how to do it like a thousand years ago. Yeah. I, I, and I read an article that there was even like an undiscovered, you know, ruins of a city that was in the Amazon, like a small like city or something. I'll have to find Which that. Which one? I'll find it and I'll let you know. Okay. Cause I was about to say, there's a couple that, there's a couple that come to mind. Um, but yeah, the archaeology there is picking up. So like, let me put it this way. Like one cool thing about um, pre-Columbian history is that like there's, all, like, there's always new stuff being discovered. There's always new things that are being uncovered. And I feel like the Amazon in like the coming decades is going to be like a big spot of discovery. Like that's kind of my prediction. You know, it's kind of in a lot of ways, like it's kind of the downside of like, you know, the expansion into the Amazon is I think people are just going to find more there the moment they start like digging into the ground. But there are also a lot of archaeologists that, you know, are trying to like, you know, like that are trying to like, you know, um, like that are trying to like, you know, kind of like scan like um, certain areas and stuff to try to find things. So, you know, hopefully that'll produce results. But I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things that people find. I definitely think there's a lot even more like undis yeah, undiscovered things that who knows because the Amazon rainforest is just so massive. Mm -hmm. so big. And oh, this is also like a fun fact. If anybody ever asks you where the earliest pottery in all the Americas come from, like it's not Mesoamerica. It's not the Andes. It's not North America where, you know, people came into the Bering Strait. It's like not the South. It's the Amazon. And it's like clearly the Amazon. It's not even close. Yeah. So like that's where like people really started. Like there was a lot of activity there very early on. Wow. Crazy. I, I was going to say, I thought the Incas or the Indian area, but the, the fact that it's the Amazons is pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. So if you could visit one country, where would you go? Oh, gee, don't ask me that. 
It'd be a lot, you know, honestly, that question would be a lot better if you asked me, like, what country I don't want to visit. Um, I don't know. It's I've read so much Mesoamerican history that I would love to go to Mexico, um, like going to like Oaxaca and like, you know, going to like seeing Montiel Bond would be like super cool, I think. Um that, that kind of sticks out to me right now, but I mean, you could ask me next week and I would give you a different answer probably. Yeah, I was just curious after all like the research you've done and the videos that you've produced and, and everything that I was always like, I wonder what country he wants to, he could go to in the Americas. Which one? You know, there, there's no bad, like, there's no bad place to visit, just kind of like there's no bad history out there. Like if history is boring, it's because it's not being presented correctly, in my opinion. You know, history isn't always like happy, but it's always interesting, I think. So, yeah, I agree. Definitely. I think for me, just colonization is you know, <laughs> as bad as it was. It is interesting to read like the, I mean, going over the research articles and everything that went on, you know, between especially like Europe and, and Asia and Europe and, mm -hmm. and uh, South America as well, Spain, I guess, in that case. I mean, of course, like, like I said, Nether Netherlands. Yeah. But um, I, may, I haven't even like gotten that much into Africa, like for example, like France and Algeria and like you said, South Africa and then mm -hmm. the Middle East and the South Asian part, even the, um, the Polynesian islands as well. Like, Oh man, we have so much. I feel like we could go on for hours, but <laughs> we will have to have you on again, Pete. This was a very, very, very interesting conversation. Hey, it was my pleasure. Just let me know when and where. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, Juan Chola, did you have anything you wanted to add on? Oh, uh, well, to all our subs, uh, we're going to be dropping Pete's channel, Ancient Americas, in the description. Uh, check out his videos. Very, very excellent videos. Very educational. Um, please subscribe to him. Thank yeah. you. Hey yeah, guys, check him out. His content is top notch. Um, but, you know, as we have to say, have a good night and uh, stay tuned. The, next the haters, we hate you too. <laughs> you guys take care. <laughs> good night. One second. Whoops.